welcome back to the Constitutional Clarion. In this video, I'm going to talk about the arguments about why people are concerned about the words executive government in the proposed referendum. Now, bear with me, this one is a little bit long, well, quite a bit long, but it's because I'm going to step you through the arguments and the legal issues so you can understand and make your own assessment. Um, I'll give you my assessment, but you can make your own on the basis of the explanation that I'm giving you as to what the issues are here. Okay, so most of the legal concerns about the voice referendum have been directed at representations being made to the executive government. So why? Well, it all comes back to administrative law. So under administrative law, government decision makers, such as ministers and government officials, who make decisions that affect individuals, must make those decisions fairly. Now, we're not talking here about general policy decisions that affect everyone or large portions of the population, nor are we talking about high-level political decisions that are made by Cabinet. What we're talking about here is particular decisions that have an impact on individuals or limited groups of individuals, such as a decision to revoke a visa or a decision to say, approve a mine, which will have particular impacts on those in the area neighboring the mine. Now, part of the requirement to make a decision in a fair way, which is known as procedural fairness, is that the decision maker has to take into account what are called relevant considerations um, and must not take into account what are called irrelevant considerations. Now, some commentators have argued that every voice representation will be a mandatory relevant consideration, which every decision maker is bound to take into account when making a decision. And that if they fail to do that, then, these people argue, that someone can go to court and seek judicial review of the decision and that the court would require the decision to be made following the correct procedure. Now, the courts in this field of administrative law do not themselves determine the outcome of the decision, the merits of the decision. That's not their role. Their role is solely to determine whether the decision has been made under a fair procedure, right? procedural fairness. And if the decision hasn't been made following that procedure, then the court will send it back to the decision maker saying, do it again following the fair procedure. Under administrative law, a matter is only a mandatory relevant consideration if the statute conferring the decision-making power on the official actually says so, or the court implies from the term of, terms of the statute that it's necessarily intended that this be a mandatory relevant consideration. And that's really important to understand to get what this whole argument's about. So let me give you an example. Section 10 of the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Heritage Protection Act 1984 sets out requirements before a minister makes a legislative instrument that protects a particular cultural heritage area. Now that process involves notice being published in a local newspaper stating that the protection is being considered and inviting interested persons to make representations. Now then due consideration must be given to those representations by an official who then prepares a report and the representations must then be forwarded also to the minister who's obliged to take them into account. And that process is all set out in that section of the statute. Now these sorts of provisions exist in abundance in Commonwealth legislation and state and territory legislation. There's nothing new or scary about them. It hasn't stopped the ability of government to work, nor has it resulted in massive litigation. This is just ordinary government business, and these are ordinary administrative laws that allow the courts to make sure that when the government makes those kinds of decisions, it does so fairly. But the more significant point here is that it's up to Parliament to decide whether to impose such an obligation upon a decision maker. If a court held that such an obligation was implied by the statutory provision, 
But Parliament then disagreed and said, no, actually, we didn't intend that. Then Parliament can amend the legislation that confers the power to make the decision so that there is no obligation on the decision maker uh, with respect to this particular um, relevant consideration. Now, ultimately, Parliament retains its control over the issue. Now, the Parliament could quite rightly decide that there are many administrative decisions in which a representation of the voice would be important and so that the decision maker should be obliged to take into account representations of the voice. And one would expect that to be the case. But equally, Parliament could decide that in certain sorts of areas, those types of decisions should not be decisions where representations of the voice are required to be taken into account. It's a matter for Parliament, it's part of the democratic process to make that kind of assessment. And if there were problems with the system of government being slowed down because of the voice needing to have time to make representations, then the government and the Parliament could adjust the legislation to resolve those problems. Now, this is where it gets a little bit more complicated because opponents of the voice then escalate the issue by arguing that that ordinary system of parliament deciding this thing, these things would be overtaken by the High Court drawing an implication from proposed section 129.2 in the amendment that any representation made by the voice is a mandatory relevant consideration in relation to all decisions made by decision makers that could fall within that category of matters relating to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples. Now they add to that implication, a further implication, that there's an obligation to advise the voice in advance of making that decision, provide the voice with all the relevant information about it, and provide the voice with adequate time to make an informed representation about it. And this is what people are worried about when they make arguments about the executive government in the amendment. Now, how do people get to the idea of that implication being made? Well, I think it comes from this. They draw an analogy with the implied freedom of political communication. Now, in that case, the High Court drew an implication from the text of the Constitution, section 7 and 24 of the Constitution, which require the Houses of Parliament to be directly chosen by the people. And the argument there was that no genuine choice could be made by the people if the people are unable to obtain information and communicate about political matters, such as policies and candidates. Hence, the Constitution contains an implied freedom of political communication because that freedom is necessary to give full effect to the requirement of the Constitution that the Houses be directly chosen by the people. So this implied freedom operates to limit the power of Parliament to legislate you know, in any way that restricts the freedom unless the law is for a legitimate purpose that's compatible with the constitutionally prescribed system of representative and responsible government, and it's proportionate to that legitimate purpose. Now, using an analogy with that development, it's argued that the High Court might find that the power or capacity conferred upon the voice to make representations to Parliament and the executive government would be ineffective if the voice was not advised and informed in advance about proposed relevant exercises of legislative or executive power, and if neither the parliament nor the executive was required to consider those representations and give adequate time for them to be made. Thus, the court might conclude, it's argued, that such an implication was intended because it is necessary to give true effect to the amendment. Okay, so that's the argument that people are making. Now, the short answer to that proposition is that the influence of the voice and the effectiveness of its representations are instead intended to be matters of politics rather than law. It's intended to be a matter for the executive government and parliament to decide how, if, and when 
the government or the parliament consults with the voice in advance and how they respond to those representations. Now, in some cases, as I said before, parliament might well decide that representations by the voice should be mandatory and therefore relevant considerations for decision makers. But in other cases, it might decide that that's not appropriate. Leaving this to parliament to decide is consistent with the system of representative and responsible government that the constitution prescribes. And that's very important when you're drawing analogies with the implied freedom of political communication. It's clear that the amendment is intended to operate this way from a number of different factors. So let me list them for you. A, the wording of the proposed amendment, because text is really important, the text of the constitution. And this wording was very deliberately chosen so that it does not impose obligations on the executive government or parliament and gives parliament very wide powers to deal with matters concerning the voice. B, the context of the proposed amendment, and that includes the history of the development of the proposed amendment through its drafts. C, the formal explanations of the amendment that have been given by the government, including the second reading speech by the Attorney General and the official explanatory memorandum. D, the opinion of the Solicitor General, which was eventually released. E, the report of the Joint, Settle, Joint Select Committee. And F, and I'm anticipating here because it hasn't been released at the time I'm doing this video, the yes case. So I'm assuming in the yes case, given that it's already in the explanatory memorandum and the second reading speech, it will again be made clear to the voters that this kind of implication is not intended. Now, going back to the implied freedom of political communication, it was much easier for the High Court back in 1992, when it first identified this implied freedom, to identify a constitutional implication in words of the constitution that had been drafted almost 100 years earlier, because there was no evidence of any direct consideration by the framers of the constitution of such an implication. So there was a blank slate, there was a nothingness there. And in that gap, the High Court was able to build this implication about what was intended. It would be infinitely harder for the High Court to draw an implication from the proposed section 129.2, where such an implication had been considered and explicitly rejected by those involved in drafting the proposed amendment, passing the proposed amendment in parliament, and those involved in putting it to the people, and where the people had voted for it on the basis of assurances that such an implication does not exist and cannot be drawn from the provisions. So it's not just me making that assumption in doing so, I'm also relying on high court authority itself and not even very old authority. So let me take you to a case called Gurner and Victoria, uh, which was a um, COVID lockdown case. And in that case, Mr. Gurner argued that the freedom of interstate movement, which is protected expressly by section 92 of the constitution, uh, should be supplemented by an implied freedom of movement within a state. And so the argument here is that to make the freedom of movement uh, of interstate movement effective, you have to be able to move within a state to get to the state border in order then to be able to fully exercise your freedom to cross the border. Okay, so you can see how that argument has analogies both to the voice argument and to the implied freedom of political communication argument. Same sort of idea, to give effect to the constitutional provision, you need some kind of an implication to support it. So that argument was made by Mr. Gurner, but it was rejected by the High Court. Their honours said that this would be contrary to the terms of the constitution, which expressly guarantees interstate interstate movement as distinct from intrastate movement, movement within a state. And they said, quote, to accept the plaintiff's argument would be to accept an implied restriction on legislative power that is wider in its operation than the expressed terms of section 92 of the constitution, unquote. 
Now, the judges then focused on the text of the Constitution and they adopted an earlier finding of the High Court where they said, if the text is explicit, the text is conclusive, alike in what it directs and what it forbids. But the High Court then went on to consider the mischief which Section 92 was intended to resolve, and they also referred to the convention debates of the 1890s, where it was stated that Section 92 would not remove the powers of the states with respect to preventing persons with contagious diseases from crossing state borders. They also pointed out that a broader form of words, which would have covered movement throughout the Commonwealth, including within a state, was proposed during those convention debates in the 1890s and was rejected. And the court concluded by stating, and this is the key quote from it all, okay, this is what they said, it would be a distinctly unsound approach to the interpretation of the constitutional text actually adopted by the framers to attribute to that text a meaning that they were evidently united in rejecting. Okay, so if the framers of the Constitution are evidently united in rejecting something, it would be an unsound, in fact, a distinctly unsound approach to interpretation uh, to follow that route. Uh, now, I should say here that distinctly unsound is about as aggressive as, aggressive as the High Court gets in throwing around insults. Okay, so yes. High Court says it would be distinctly unsound to interpret the Constitution in a way that the framers of the Constitution were united in rejecting. The unanimous High Court authority in Goerner from 2020 suggests how the court would approach the issue today. It would focus primarily on the text, but it would also look to what was intended. Unlike the case of the implied freedom of political communication, where there was no evidence that the framers considered and rejected the existence of such a freedom, in the case of a voice, it would be very clear what was intended. As in the Goerner case, the High Court would therefore take into account the fact that those involved in framing the amendment had expressly rejected any implication that the voice must be advised in advance of a decision given information and time to make adequate representations and that its representations must be considered. Now, you might think, well, that's enough in terms of barriers, but there are actually even more to that. So let me just add to this uh, further barriers to making that implication. So the first one is practicality, and the second one is that it's contrary to the High Court's previous approach in relation to constitutional implications and mandatory relevant considerations. Now, the impracticality argument has previously been put by former Chief Justice Robert French and uh, Professor Emeritus Jeff Lindell, and it has a number of aspects to it. Now, first of all, the wording of Section 129.2 does not support this kind of an implication because it authorises the voice to make representations to the Parliament and Executive Government on matters relating to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples. Now, drawing such an implication with respect to the representations made to Parliament would be inconsistent with the freedom of Parliament to manage its own internal proceedings and be contrary to a long line of authorities that the courts would not interfere with the internal deliberations of Parliament. Now, if that implication cannot be drawn from one aspect of Section 129.2, that is, representations to Parliament, makes it far more difficult to justify it in relation to another aspect of that section, which is representations to the executive government. But even there, once you try, start trying to apply it to representations to the executive government, you've got a second problem, and that is you've got to slice and dice that one too, because the courts have previously accepted that the political aspects of policy making are not amenable to doctrines of procedural fairness, and they've drawn a distinction between the formulation of policy as opposed to application of it to individuals in making particular decisions. 
So the court will not intervene, for example, in cabinet decisions about policies directed at general social or political goals, or even what legislation should be introduced into parliament. And this is because those matters are inherently political in nature and not matters in which the courts, uh, it's appropriate for the courts to intervene. So if the High Court were to try and draw an implication from Section 129 too, well, they're going to have to get out their knives and slice and dice it. So you're going to have to slice off the bit about Parliament and even the bit that refers to executive government, you're going to have to chop that into bits as well so that you confine your implication to a subgroup of matters um, dealt with by the executive government, being those where government decision makers, such as ministers or public servants, exercise a power to make decisions that affect particular individuals or groups. And this whole idea of slicing and dicing to come up with some kind of necessary implication is extremely problematic. But the third point here is that because the scope of matters about which the voice can make representations is in itself so broad, so that's matters relating to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples, it would be very difficult in practical terms for a decision maker to know when the decision maker should advise the voice in advance, whether it needed to wait for a representation or indeed which, if any, of the representations made by the voice, because over time the voice could make tens of thousands of different representations, uh, which representations did it need to consider? The uncertainty involved and the sheer breadth of decision making potentially affected would result potentially in quite excessive administrative burdens, not only for the government, but for the voice itself, which would presumably be flooded with information about thousands of forthcoming decisions, most of which are petty and irrelevant, um, every day. It would be unsustainable for the voice and for the government and completely impractical. Now, this this point you're saying, aha, that's the reason for not letting this into the Constitution. Uh, so opponents of the voice have raised this as a risk and they say that it would lead to paralysis of the government, making it impossible to manage. But that in itself is a really strong reason why the High Court would not do it. Right? It's not in the interests of the court to try and disrupt government and make it incapable of functioning. It would be extremely difficult to imply from the Constitution uh, an implication that would gum up the works of government and make it impossible to operate. I mean, frankly, why would you do it? And you'd know if you did do it, by the way, that there'd be pretty quick smart another referendum which would remove the power altogether. Um, again, not particularly in anyone's interest to provoke that. The final point here is that the High Court has never approached mandatory relevant considerations in this kind of way, connecting them to constitutional implications. But we do have one case, again, a fairly recent case, uh, in which the High Court has to some extent address the issue. Now, this is the Banerjee case, Comcare and Banerjee. And the contention there was that a decision maker was obliged to take into consideration the implied freedom of political communication as a mandatory relevant consideration when making decisions about, uh, under the Public Service Act, about sanctioning a public service servant. And uh, the High Court rejected in a joint judgment, that um, suggestion. The implied freedom of political communication, they pointed out, operates as a limit on legislative power. So it would operate as on a limit of the power conferred on the public servant under the, the Public Service Act to make decisions. But the implication itself did not operate as a mandatory relevant consideration. Their honours accepted, however, that the implied freedom of political communication could operate as a mandatory relevant consideration, but, this is the critical bit, but that it depends upon the legislation that confers the power on the decision maker. So in other words, the existence of the constitutional implication does not itself create the mandatory relevant consideration that is applicable in relation to all decisions. It is the power 
It is the statute that gives the power to the decision maker, which will be what's crucial for determining whether or not any kind of implication or express requirement um, of uh, that the voice, voices representations be a relevant consideration. It's the statute that does that, not the constitution. Ultimately, this is a matter for parliament when it confers discretionary power. For all those reasons, and there have been many of them, as you've seen, I can't see the High Court drawing such an implication from the Constitution. The risk we are talking about here is really tiny. Now, some people will say, well, we shouldn't even take tiny risks when it comes to the Constitution. But if that's the case, then basically we are never going to change the Constitution because every change is going to involve some tiny kind of risk. And if that's the case, then we're stuck with a constitution that's frozen in time and becomes increasingly out of step with the real Australia that we live in today. And that, my friends, is itself a risk and probably a much greater risk than the concern people have about this weird implication they think the High Court is going to draw. Now, just to conclude here, back in 1891, when the Constitutional Convention was formed to draft a constitution for this idea of a federated Australia joining together all the Australian colonies, so Samuel Griffith, a man who was not known to be a radical and about whom or in whose honour a fairly conservative um, society has been formed, he gave a speech to the banquet at the very beginning of that Constitutional Convention. And this is what he said. There is no doubt that here, as everywhere, there will be timid men who are afraid of launching something new. But when was there ever a great thing achieved without risking something? Federation was a huge risk in comparison to the voice. And most of us would agree that Federation actually was a pretty great thing. So thank you, Sir Samuel Griffith, for taking that risk. Thank you too for you to getting all the way to the end of this rather long video. Uh, well done to you. I hope it has informed you um, and will help you make your own independent assessment as to how to vote in the referendum. Thank you very much for watching and I'll see you next time. Goodbye.